spooky friends, and welcome to another episode of the Scariest Podcast. Woo! I'm Robin Grace, and this is Adam Diaz, and Hello. we're going to tell you guys some interesting topics today. Indeed we are. I'm really excited. Uh, like you were saying earlier, I don't know exactly how well our topics match up. They don't match. But it's still some <laughs> Not really, even a little bit. really good stuff. You're probably it's... looking at the title already, and you're like, I don't think those things pair well. But... So what's going to happen is we're going on vacation. Yes. So we're doing back-to-back episodes to cover the two weeks that we're it's going to cover and it's kind of going to be like a swap. You actually came up with a topic idea yesterday and I had been thinking about doing something similar, but we wanted to do different subjects. So tell them what it is. So wait, for next week? For this week. Well, oh. I mean, well, I'm doing one now. You're doing one next week. Uh, we're going to do diseases. <laughs> you got one disease this week. I got a disease next week. It's I got a lot be, of diseases all the time. But... It's going to be interesting. You can't yeah. see my robot arms, but they're there. She was talking about doing a specific disease. And I was like, that's really weird because I was thinking I would do the Spanish flu. And uh, it's funny, too, because she was going to go first, and then she decided to change her topic. Uh, So the one that you guys are going to hear this week is what, Robin? So I'm going to cover the Warrens, Ed and Lorraine Warren and Annabelle. So you're going to do, like, the story of them and the doll together, correct? Yeah. Um, And not necessarily, like, everything that they've done, because they've done a lot. It's just how they pertain to the doll specifically. Cool. Right on. Mm -hmm. So it's not like a full biography. That would be a really, that would be like a series of episodes if we wanted to do Ed and Lorraine They Warren. have g- done so many They really have. Things, I would so. absolutely love to meet Lorraine Warren. I think it would be amazing. It would be super, super cool. So Lorraine Warren, if you're one of our listeners, hit us up. Oh, man. Be super I highly awesome. doubt she listens to podcasts. Um, but for those of you who do listen to us routinely, we appreciate all of you. And uh, for those of you who have listened to any episode so far in January, you know it is currently January Patreon push. <laughs> maybe i'll get a sound effect for it probably not because january is already eight days gone uh but we do want you to go over to patreon.com slash scarish podcast and sign up for as little as a dollar a month seriously guys it is four quarters if you walk past a vending machine and you saw a candy bar and one of them said scarish it would be the cheapest fucking candy bar in there and it would really help us out and if we get to 50 patrons for the month of January, we are going to, one, do what we said we were going to do at 50, which is go to the Winchester Mansion. And two, I have to wear a uh, cheerleader uniform in the theme of scaryish, And uh, it's a stupid bet that I made. But, hey, I made it. And I'd be really, really excited to have to fulfill it because that would mean we're at 50. So head over to patreon.com slash podcast. We usually only talk about this stuff at the end of the show. Uh, but we wanted to actually put it in at the beginning because, hey, some of you guys just skip the end of the show anyways. So... But that said, uh, we're going to go ahead and jump into the thing that we normally do to start our episodes, which is homegrown horrors. And Robin, what is a homegrown horror? It's you, because you're a homegrown whore. I'm a fucking uh... mess right now. We just had to take a break because I spilled water all over the desk, and that like re-intro took me like two attempts to do it. So just help me out here and keep going. Okay, okay so homegrown horrors are the stories and experiences uh, that you guys have, you know, come across. So spiritual or uh, paranormal type weird things, super funny things that you thought were horrible, scary things that ended up just being uh, light fixtures. <laughs> or That's something. a really good example. Or it's like ridiculous coincidences or things that are really weird that have happened to you. Uh, if you want to share those with us, email storytime at scarish.com. That is our email address. If you have a friend that might not even listen to the show, but you know they have a story, one, suggest they listen to the show. And two, suggest that they send us their story. That way you can get them like, involved and they'll want to actually come and listen because they want to hear their story told and they can do that through either the email scariest.com is our website you can click contact us and send us your story that way you can go to any of our social medias uh, facebook.com slash scariest podcast message us on there click like on the page if you have already sent us your story if you don't have a story to send still go to the facebook page and click like we always appreciate that you can join the scariest spooky friends group on facebook and post there for some instant feedback you can also go to our discord server the best way to find that is just to go to our website it has links to all of our social media click on the discord one and you can get some instant feedback from the community or you can just play around in our discord server we have a bunch of stuff i love the dad joke corner it makes me crack my shit up all the time when i see it uh and then you can also tweet at us at scarish pod or you can message us on instagram at scarish podcast so we have a lot of ways for you folks to reach out to us and we suggest you do so uh if you want to you know we want to talk to you and if you want to talk to us let's do it let's do it so i think you are going first this week if i am not mistaken uh, yep. So the topic for this email is Top Hat Man. Uh, the email goes, hello again. You can share on the podcast. Uh, just refer to me as P. And it's a her. She. Cool. What's up, P? Um, that sounds so weird. It did sound weird. That didn't sound good flowing off the tongue. So. so I really like the podcast. 
I emailed last week about the experiences that I've had. Last week, I just started the podcast, so I wasn't many episodes in, and I'm now on episode 45, uh, Homegrown Horrors. That's a lot of episodes in. Yeah, I was going to say, did you start at the at the back catalog at episode zero, oh, or did yeah. you start at the top and work your way down? Because well, people do those two different ways, and it's really weird how people do that. What them. episode number is this? This is episode 57 of the regular podcast. Okay, so, well, this is two and a half months ago, too, so we did we weren't really that... So maybe they, it we is, didn't have an episode forty five right. for Homegrown Horror yet. I don't yeah. think. I don't know. Anyway, uh, I now have heard a lot of stories about the tall man with a top hat, uh, probably from Netflix's n- yeah, Hill that, House. Right. Yeah. Anyway, here's an update on the house I just recently moved into. I just got a cat last week, and his name's Ash. All I think of is Ash from Overwatch now. All I think of is Ash from Evil Dead and Army of Darkness. Whenever I hear that name, what's sad is no one thought Ash Ketchum. Yeah. Poor Ash. That's very true. Um, Probably because he spends that entire show losing because he sucks. Shut up. So I've never actually watched Pokemon. I've only watched it like feverishly in the background like four years ago when I was super sick and you were taking care of me and you put it on the TV. And all I remember about watching that show is every time I'd pay attention, he was losing a battle. And I was like, this kid is definitely not the very best that no one ever was. The goal is to become the very best. Yeah, but I mean, he's doing it the wrong way. (laughs) He's losing. He's losing his way to the top, apparently, which is a difficult strategy to uh, employ, I believe. So it's all learning from your mistakes. Oh, okay. It's all a lesson. Every episode. He is the most learned Pokemon trainer I've ever seen. (laughs) You need to learn. Okay. I don't know what that means. Well, I'd like to see you battle with a Pikachu that hates you. The Pikachu hates him? Well, when he first gets to Pikachu, that's why he has like a uh, like clothesline and rubber gloves because Pikachu keeps shocking him. Well, I imagine that's just the difficulties of dealing with a mouse that's made of fucking electricity. I can't wait to see. I cannot wait to see Detective Pikachu though. I am so excited about Detective Pikachu just because Ryan Reynolds is, is the voice. Be Pikachu. Yeah, people it's are so pissed amazing. about that. I'm like, whatever, dude. It doesn't matter who voices him as long as it's good. Uh, well, was it in the video game or something that his voice was super deep and people were like, what? I thought people were saying for a while that Denny DeVito was going to be the voice of Pikachu, which is just hilarious to think that that would be his voice. But I don't know. I don't know if his, his voice was super deep in the video game. I don't know which video game you mean either. Detective Pikachu. There's a video game called Detective yes. Pikachu? God, Nintendo owns the world, man. It is oh insane. Oh my gosh. I have, a, the, the, I have a Detective Pikachu amiibo and he's adorable. I know. I got Look it for him. you. He's cute. Okay. So anyway. Uh, here's an update on the house I just recently moved into. I got a cat last week named Ash. His litter box is in the back part of the house in the hallway where the bathroom, spare bedroom, and door to the basement is. So that's, I'm assuming, in like the middle of nowhere in a home. I'm, I'm assuming you're keeping it back there so he can keep the demons in the basement. So. Oh, okay. Uh, remind you, he is litter box trained. My fiance noticed Ash peeing on our rug. We couldn't figure out why, but we noticed that we that he would only go into his litter box if we were in the hall or in the bathroom. So he will not go back there alone. Wow. The, I think your cat wouldn't be afraid of anything like that, but I don't know. Some cats may be a little bit skittish, might be a little bit pissed off. Our cat is scared of everything. Yeah, that's very true. But I don't know. When it comes to the litter box, I feel like that's just their place that they're going to go to, you know? Yeah. So something must be scaring it. That said, cats can be assholes and do things out of anger, like vomit in your shoes or chew up all your cords. One time, my ex and I didn't do laundry enough, and there was a pile of laundry on the floor. And And I'm going to guess you also didn't clean litter boxes often enough. We had one of those litter boxes that automatically did the litter. And maybe it broke. I don't know. But... Uh, my ex was like doing the laundry one day and stepped into the laundry and just stepped into a pile of shit. That's so fucking The gross. cat had pooped in the pile of clothes. It was disgusting. I don't know what's worse, <laughs> cat poop or cat pee all over your clothes. I feel like poop <laughs> might be able to wash out, but I feel like that pee is so oh, gross. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It just would not come out. Well, have you ever seen that little video of the cat that just poops on top of the little girl's chest? No, that's so... <laughs> oh, yeah, the, ch- yeah, the little girl in the car. I have like seen that. It's like a little kitten, and the girl's just like, ah! That's a traumatizing moment. Uh, that's just like, that kid will never like cats ever again for as long as I they live. I just think it's freaking hilarious. Or the, the little picture of the cat pooping in the pot of rice. I've never seen that before. Oh, my gosh. That's so gross, So though. gross. Okay, anyway, enough of that. Um, a little kitty Cleveland steamer. <laughs> That's so fucking gross. Ew. Okay. The cat literally refuses to go in the hall where the man supposedly passed away 
in the back room. Wow, that's super fucking creepy. That's super freaking creepy. Why would you take this place if you knew someone died in there? Sometimes you can't help it. Ash is very cute, though. The cat is very cute. It's still a kitten. Well, no, now it, it'd probably be like way bigger. I mean, our backlog is so extensive that it's yeah, probably like it's probably five way years bigger. old. At this Update point. picks. <laughs> it's kind of i love cat pics so if you guys ever want to send pictures of any of your pets we do have hashtag omen babies if you tag it hashtag omen babies tag us on twitter a lot of them a lot of them make it on discord so if any of you guys haven't joined discord but you like pet pics that is a very popular channel and there are so many omen babies flying through that channel yeah and uh i love the golden girls kittens that we have going on right now explain that so uh we have a lot of awesome spooky friends in the discord and and on twitch and stuff like that that all love golden girls and our lovely spooky friend Carly uh, found some kittens and has been taking care of them. And she named them after the a couple girl, golden girls, which I think is so cute. It's Blanche and who's the other one? Oh, I don't. I can't watch, remember the names of golden girls. I don't I can't watch it the enough. Cats and proxy. you know they're gonna be like, what the heck? Because we have no idea. But I. We are not good with Golden, Golden Girls, Girls. Is an older show, okay? You can get off our backs. It's not. It's not a big deal. We haven't watched Golden Girls, okay? Like, let's talk about Murphy Brown instead. What's Murphy Brown? I'm not going over this again. Okay, <laughs> I'll tell you off the air. Okay. Uh. Anyway, I have another story, but it's my suicide attempt. Sad face. I'm gonna say sad face. Sorry, that is super hard to handle. And um, I'll save it for another day or when I don't feel shamed to talk about it. I don't think anybody should ever feel ashamed. Uh, to talk about it because it's something that you've you fought through exactly it's a battle you won and i don't think you should ever feel ashamed about that like that's why i really like the whole semicolon thing because people were getting tattoos of semicolons i know people are still doing it because a semicolon is where a sentence could end but it continues yeah and uh i think that's just a good representation of it's like you don't have to wear it on your sleeve it doesn't have to be something that you you like have to tell everyone it's just if you choose to share it with us we appreciate it and if not we totally understand but we're very happy that you won that battle yeah and i i love that so many of the people that we have in discord can talk about it and are so supportive of right. other people when they want to talk about it um because it is hard life is fucking hard life is very fucking so hard. It's very true uh kudos to you and uh continuing on sorry my story is long thanks for all the things that you guys do p uh, your story's not at all long. It's yeah, pretty, don't even worry about very it. straight to the point. Thank you. We appreciate it. You know, it's long. Our tangents. Our I tangents know. last forever. They, I think that's what made the story long. I want to be the, the very The best. Pokemon tangent, the cat poop tangent, no just like, <laughs> just lots of tangents. <laughs> a, it's a lot of tangents, so right on. Well, I'm going to move into my email, and this one's subject is not really a scary story. So, cool. Cool. We were saying before, you don't have to always send us spooky stuff, and uh, it's nice to see that you guys take that to heart. And it starts out like this. Hello, Adam and Robin. Hello. Hello. Uh, I have a short, not really scary story that you can read on the podcast. I used to live in an old house that was really cozy. Because it was old, the stairs creaked and other places creaked as well. You know what? I creak in other places as well because I'm 33. Because we're getting old. I'm getting cozy, apparently. It's good to know. And whenever I walk by and like my hip pops or something, my sister's like, you're falling apart. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> uh, but the house didn't give me a creepy feeling. As a kid, I was always scared of monsters under my bed. And one time I saw two baby tigers walk past my bed. I slept in the same room as my brother and didn't really think much of it, as it was probably my imagination. Some years later, when I was 12, I was feeling a bit sad and didn't really know what to do about it. I was home alone and went to my parents' bedroom. I listened to Midnight Memories of One Direction. I don't know what that song is, but I know who One Direction is. Yeah, we know who One Direction is. That's Uh, it. (laughs) That's it. (laughs) But what is that song? Something, you don't know you're beautiful? That's such a shitty song. Or is that a Justin Bieber song? No, that's that's One okay. Direction. <laughs> I say it's a shitty song because it's like, what makes you beautiful is that you don't know you're beautiful. It's like, so a woman with confidence can't be beautiful? Fuck you, One Direction. Oh so, my God. <laughs> sorry, I don't mean to shit on your band. It's just one of the songs I listen to and I'm like, wow, man, that's kind of insulting. That's what makes you beautiful. Okay, let me get back to this. Uh, for some reason, <laughs> the wind... <laughs> For some reason, the window moved, in parentheses, probably the wind, but I just felt like there was some kind of presence. So it's because I asked, it was a window. What does that mean? Probably the wind. It was because it was a window. The wind moved a wind dough? Yeah, it was a window. I hate you so much. <laughs> so they think there's a presence here. The email goes on. So I asked, do you want a party? <laughs> what a weird thing to ask a spirit. And then ghost cocaine just came oh out God. of nowhere. <laughs> And I just danced for 10 minutes on my own, in parentheses, or not. 
I would often go back there to dance or to feel less alone. And if there That's was cute. ever some kind of presence, it would have been a friendly one because it kept me company and it gave me a really nice feeling. I hope my grammar wasn't too bad. I'm from the Netherlands and English isn't my first language. It wasn't bad at all. Uh, thanks for reading these stories and keep up the good work. Greetings. Nice. Yursa. I don't know how to say this name. Y-R-S-A. Yursa. I'm going to go with Yursa. Okay. But it might be pronounced Ursa? differently. If so, let me know how I fucked up your name and I will apologize okay. to you. I'm apologizing um, right now. But thank you for sending that story. I, think I appreciate it. when it comes to seeing the tigers, I think um, it, everyone kind of has maybe like spirit animals, like legit spirit animals. I don't know if you've ever watched the show So Weird. It used to be a Disney show. and uh, Sounds weird. Um, the, the chick from Instant Star used to be one of the characters on it in the later seasons but she had like a spirit animal and it was just a panther and she would just randomly see a panther in random places was it chadwick boseman no it wasn't well, I, it I fucking knew it <laughs> um but it was such a good show and i i wish there were a place to watch it but it was so weird like the show was called so weird it was awesome it was like one of those monster of the week shows with like a little like story a twist. Well, a story that goes through the whole thing. They oh, just, like continuity to it. Right. Because they're the main character's mom is in like a rock band. And so they travel on her tour bus. Was it One Direction? <laughs> oh, my God. It all makes sense. <laughs> and they go on this tour bus and they're going across the country and the different places that they go to, they experience different weird things. Right on. So and um, that's what makes her beautiful. Uh, sure. Sure. And so it was a really good show, but that's seeing the tiger has kind of reminded me of that where she kept seeing panthers everywhere. And I think everyone might have that in them somewhere, like a guardian of some sort. A spirit animal. Yeah. That maybe every now and then that you happen to see. That could be. Yeah. I could see that. I kind of like that. Like owls, like you like owls and yeah. sometimes. I don't you... see them very often. So. No, but you hear them. I mean, I've heard, I don't hear them very often either. Hoo. I hear them all the time when I meet evil people. They're hooing at me to warn me. Hoo. I wish. Hoo. Fuck. Hoo. I hate you so much. <laughs> oh, now I want to watch CSI. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so before cool. we move into our main topics of the show, I do want to take a brief moment to make an historical announcement. I don't think it's actually that An big. historical? What? It's just, it's an announcement we've been waiting to make for a little while. We discussed it, that we were going to make it on the show. You're looking blank face like yeah, you don't know I'm what like, I'm about what, to do. Yeah, I'm like, what is he about to say? So uh, we often take tangents on this show when we talk about just... A bunch of random shit. And anyone who's listened to us uh, knows that Robin and I have very dissimilar tastes, but we also have very similar tastes that overlap. So what kind of makes this show fun to do is how often one of us brings up something the other person has never heard of. And it's often a fixture in the household where one of us will mention a TV show or a movie uh, that the other one hasn't seen. And it's the same thing I always hear. And this used to happen when I used to live in the apartment. We had a roommate. I'd bring up something that I hadn't seen. And I'd have yelled at me, you've never seen that? And I'd be like, no, I'm sorry. I apologize. I haven't seen that. And then they, eventually someone says, like, we need to watch it. And we always say, like, we'll add it to the list. And, of course, I do it exactly back to anyone else, especially you who hasn't seen the stuff that I've seen. Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff because even though our tastes are very similar, they are very dissimilar. So we, like, will expose ourselves to the stuff, our significant. Well, that's how you started watching Doctor Who. Exactly. That's how you started watching football. You know? So. <laughs> oh, have you ever watched Rudy? Yes, I have okay, watched Rudy. Okay, see, all my coworkers today were like, you gotta watch Rudy. It's like one of the greatest football movies of all time. And I know so much trivia about Rudy. Like, what? Yeah, because like what Vince Vaughn and John Favreau wrote that movie. They did the whole like Goodwill Hunting thing before Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. So it's like, I have all this useless knowledge about these movies that I've seen, and I think it's really fun to talk about, but we so often go on these really lengthy tangents because we're just filled with this worthless knowledge of all these things we're interested in. And me and Robin have been kicking around this idea for a little while, and shout out to Carly, because Carly, uh, one of our listeners who helped us build the Discord, uh, had a podcast similar to this, and uh, we talked to her about it a little bit. I know I messaged her and said, like, hey... Uh, we've decided we are going to move forward and we are going to do a movie podcast and we're calling it you've never seen that and the premise is uh, every week one of us will pick a movie that the other person has never seen and then we will watch it and then we'll come and record directly afterwards and basically we're going to break down uh, what it is and we'll do the intro to the movie so if it's a movie I picked I'll talk about the movie like when I first saw it stuff like that. And then give some background to it. And then it's going to be full-blown spoilers. We're not going to be doing like no, yeah. Avengers Endgame or anything it's like that. It's a spoiler cast. It's definitely a spoiler cast, but we're going to go but through But it's going to be like movies that are already out. That exactly. have been out. And the best thing about this is like I've always wanted to do a movie podcast. But movie podcasts are cliche at this point because there's so many of them. 
But there's so many that are bad movie podcasts, you know, where you watch a shitty movie and you make fun of it. And this is going to be about the movies that we love. That we like, you know, and we love. And we yeah. get to make you, like, I get to make you watch movies that up to this point you're like, no, I don't want to watch that. And I get uh. to force you to watch them now. And likewise, I'm going to have to watch Mulan finally. You know, I'm going to have to watch. I cannot believe you've never seen I've Mulan. I've never seen Mulan. But you're going to have to watch, like. You're going to have to watch stuff with me. You're going to have to watch Tombstone, you know? You're going to have to watch the original Rocky. And I cannot Ugh. fucking wait. And there's a bunch of other ones, and they're going to be movies like I cannot wait to watch. And it's just going to be really fun. I've never watched Raiders of the Lost Ark. Have you, you're just saying that because you want to watch Raiders <laughs> I want to watch Ark. Indiana Jones all the time. But, I mean, we're going to set up so good. We're gonna set up stuff like we set stuff up for this podcast. We're going to have a Patreon set up for that one and for Patreon-exclusive content. We've kicked around a lot of ideas. Like, we might do riff tracks or just, like, record our I audio think, of us watching the movie I for the first time. I think that would be really cool to record for patrons exclusively is just, like, sit there watch a movie and record it so that the patrons can literally press play and listen. And like, it's like, it's like that fucking like meme director's where it's, commentary or something yes. at the same time. Yeah. It's like that meme where it's like, I like listening to podcasts and it shows someone like sitting there eating cereal next to a poster of people laughing and they're laughing too. Like what I feel like when I listen to podcasts, yeah. it's just another dimension to that. And uh, there's just a lot of stuff we can do with it. I also want to do something where we can watch movies that we love and have that maybe be a Patreon exclusive thing that we do every now and then. But there's a lot we can do with it. I'm really excited. It's going to be called You've Never Seen That, and we're going to launch it at the beginning of February. We don't have a specific date yet because we don't know what day we want the episodes to release on, like every week, uh, but it will be weekly, and I'm really, really, really excited for it. So if we eventually run out of movies, so we, we have There's exposed no each other to everything we've ever seen, then we'll just go and find new movies that we both haven't seen and watch those together or go to the movie theater and watch new movies and then talk about them. Yeah. And like, I'm really excited there's to no do. There's no way though. The cinema, like there's just so there's such much a huge backlog. backlog of cinema history. Yeah. And it's insane. And so it'll be so cool. Cause then I'm going to have to make you watch like that touch of mink. Like, Oh, don't these. even know what that is. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And it's just, it's going to be a really fun time. And for like some information, like when I met Robin, she had never seen like, Goodwill Hunting or the Shawshank Redemption. She basically hasn't. She still hasn't seen the Shawshank Redemption. Yes, I you, have. You were reading like through two thirds no. of it, so we have to do that. That's bullshit. Okay, who's Andy Dufresne? The main character. Oh, you were fucking lucky on that. Whose nickname is Red? Uh, the guy that gets murdered. No, that's see the see? <laughs> that's Morgan Freeman. This is what I'm talking about. Like she doesn't remember these details, so like I get to make her rewatch this stuff and go through <laughs> like cinematic masterpieces I was <laughs> and really really fun movies like. I don't know. I, I was thinking of action movies that she's never seen. Like, have you ever seen The Running Man? No. There you go. Like, I get to watch 80s movies again. Have you ever seen, like, all the 007 movies? I've seen most. No, okay, let me rephrase this. I have seen almost all of Pierce Brosnan's. Oh, so not the good ones. And of Daniel Craig's. But I haven't seen, like, anything before that. I think I saw t -Daltz, But I think uh, that's, that's the only uh... other ones. Don't talk shit about Timothy Dalton. I just... <laughs> Sean Connery. That's all I got to say. I mean, I like Sean Connery. I have watched every single 007 movie because my dad loves 007. And same thing with Jackie Chan. He loved Jackie Chan. I've he seen a lot Jet of Jackie Lee. Chan movies. Um, So I just grew up on fucking 007 movies. You were fucking 007. No. Oh, man. That would have been crazy. But no. Uh, Yeah. We are super nerdy. We are super nerdy. And you can obviously see it like... Uh, well, it's not C. You can hear it. <laughs> but I'm really, really excited to start this. And really quickly, I want to jump into the... We have a Google Doc between Robin and I, and we have a column each. She has a column of movies that she wants to see that I've never seen, and vice versa. I have one of those, too. And I'm just going to read off a couple that I'm really, really excited that I get to force Robin to watch. And then you folks, if you want to, get to listen to the recap of what we talk about after it's over. So, uh... I get to make her watch Aliens for the first time ever, which is going to be super fucking exciting. And, yeah. like, planes, trains, and automobiles. And it's just, like, Cinderella Man is a good one. Empire Records You're gonna is a really good one. You're going to have to watch Ponyo. And you've never watched Ponyo. Or Coco. Like, I can't. And you haven't watched the Resident Evil. I never watched like, any of the Resident Evil oh movies. Oh, my nope. goodness. This is, it's, there's a lot. And, there's a lot on this list. We like, have enough listed here already for over a year's worth of podcast. And uh, it was funny because Adam looked at my list for the first time and he's like, what the fuck is my sassy girl? And I was like, it's a Korean movie. You're going to be watching it. Like how? Uh, it's After so... she said I had to watch the Korean movie, I was like, you know what I'm putting on there? The Last Dragon. And you're going to learn who Bruce Leroy have is. You, have you watched the, the Labyrinth yet? 
No. Pan's Labyrinth Path, or The Labyrinth? Pan's Labyrinth. I've never Sorry. watched Pan's Labyrinth. And you've never watched The Labyrinth? I have watched it when I was a kid. I remember nothing of it aside from David Bowie being, being in it. Awesome. Yeah, but he's awesome. He was awesome and everything. He's still awesome. But okay. Super <laughs> excited. But that's the announcement that we did want to make. You've never seen that. And uh, we'll have an address for our website. Uh, we've thought of a bunch of stuff that just doesn't work out because all of it's taken. But we're going to find an address for our website to announce when the show goes up. We'll have a Patreon for the show when it goes up. And uh, you guys can suggest things to us as well and say, have you ever seen this? And we'll have a hashtag. We'll have all that oh fun stuff. Oh my gosh, that's genius. I know. And maybe even once a month or once every couple months, we can both watch a movie we've both never seen that the listeners have suggested to us. And just don't suggest garbage is all I recommend. Yeah, but please be we'll good We'll have movies. official rules and all that stuff. I shouldn't say okay. rules, but like guidelines for you guys. And, and it we'll should, I, can, I shouldn't it. say like, let it be good movies because it's like. It might be a good movie that we just don't like. Right. So. And I've made you watch some long shit before. Like, you had like never Pearl seen. Pearl Harbor? And I, oh, fuck. I really don't want to watch <laughs> Pearl Harbor. But I've made her watch The Stand, which is an eight-hour miniseries. But was good. Before. It is good. It's Stephen King. And they're remaking it. Oh, we got to watch The Langoliers again. Langoliers I haven't seen since I was a kid. But I do remember The Langoliers. Yeah. It's creepy. But, yeah. So, very excited. You've never seen that. That's what it's going to be called. So, uh, we will have all the announcements on the website and all the... Uh, social media and stuff like that which i have to book before the show goes live some of you, you fuckers don't steal it um but we'll have all that stuff ready to go when we give you the announcement and it should be the first week of february we just haven't picked the specific date yet cool so fun fun stuff that said you are here to listen to scary ish stuff and robin i believe you're going first with your topic so uh take it away all right so um while I was trying to think of a second topic, because my first topic was a disease. So the, for the second topic that I was going to do that we've somehow swapped because I'm an idiot, um, I was like, well, have we done Annabelle yet? And I was so surprised that we haven't. I've covered so many haunted dolls and stuff like that, that I was like, I haven't done Annabelle the doll yet. How have I not done Sometimes this Sometimes we, because we're so like, we need to cover this or cover that, and they're relatively obscure things, we miss the big ones. Yeah. And so it was just mind-blowing to me. And maybe I've mentioned it before. I don't know. But uh, I think last year or the year before that, probably the year before that, because Nerd Chills still existed. Annabelle Creation. That we went to go yes. see Annabelle Creation. And uh, we were super lucky. We got to go see like a pre-release of it. It was great. Um, it's a huge argument in the fucking theater. Oh, man. Yeah. Because like some guy didn't want to scooch down and be like, scooch one extra seat next to strangers to create two seats next to each other. Right. And he started a huge fucking argument and, and refused to move so that this giant very nice very muscle-bound black dude and his girlfriend could sit down and this little tiny dude was such a fucking asshole like no one move for us i have friends up there you want to move six people so we can all sit next together fuck them and he was being such a douche and eventually the the, the event- woman that was yeah. running the entire event literally told him like either you move or you get out because it's free and I, th- you didn't pay for anything. Just move. The best part. And I was just sitting there like, please let this resolution happen is he moved and this fucking guy, he told to go fuck himself. That had to be like six, five, just like 300 pounds, six, five rip black dude sat right next to him for this two hour long movie. And I was just sitting back there like, man, it's gotta be so fucking awkward. I love <laughs> it so much. Uh, but it was great. And uh, if you've never heard of, Annabelle creation or anything. It's one of those Ed and Lorraine Warren movies that coincide with the conjuring and stuff. So. And creation is like the prequel. So it's definitely going into fictional. It's no longer based on true right. events type stuff. Yeah. But, uh, it, but it was good. Think... It was one of my favorite ones. Yeah, it, I it... like the conjuring Annabelle creation conjuring two and then Annabelle in that order. So, oh, really? Yeah, and I haven't seen The Nun. So if you're asking me what I my really take was on The Nun. I really want to see The Nun. Really like The Nun trailer. Fucked my cousin right up. I got to watch <laughs> people <laughs> scream. We were, we were trying to watch a comedy, and that fucking trailer came <laughs> on. And when she popped up, we were there to watch that tag movie called oh, Tag. Oh, that's right. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, and uh, the, I don't know why. It was a comedy, and they decided to put a horror trailer I had already seen the front. trailer on IMDb. So when it came on, I was like... Oh, fuck yeah. And I was just watching everyone in the audience like, this is going to be good. But it was great. I totally enjoyed watching it. And it kind of gave me this, like, I really want to know more um, after the movie. And honestly, I never actually went in to look at it because... Would you like to know more? uh, Do you know what that's from? No. Starship Troopers? Okay. See, I've watched Starship Troopers a million times, but... It's not like... I feel like you're just saying that because you don't want to make me <laughs> make no. you watch Starship Troopers. <laughs> no, I watched it a million times. My friends growing up used to watch it and stuff. Like Brett and stuff used to watch oh, it. Oh, yeah. So. I can see Brett always watching that. Um, for sure. Yeah. No, I never actually went and looked into it because Scariest didn't exist yet. 
So it and was for just, the longest time, you were super anti-scary stuff. Yeah, I, you for the most part are still anti-scary stuff. Right. Adam keeps saying like, let's go like hunting ghosts and no. shit. No. Okay. Well. Okay. If you're gonna put all the cards on the table, here's here's what's happened to me this past week. I'm looking for work. I'm feeling very confident about what's coming down the pipe. And I was thinking to myself, five like, five. I hate you. I was thinking to myself, that's from Aliens, by the way. I was thinking to myself, like, you know what I am? Like, I keep thinking, like, I want to do this because I'm good at it. But what I really want to do is, like, what we do right now. Like, I wish we could do Scarish for a living. And it totally just fucking hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm Wayne Campbell from Wayne's World at the beginning of Wayne's World. Where he's like, what I really wish is that I could do Wayne's World for a living. So I'm like, where's my fucking Rob Lowe to offer me $5,000 <laughs> and try and take my girl? Oh, <laughs> like. <laughs> and then eventually Christopher Walken shows up and tries to take my girl. And just like it just hit me. I'm like, holy fuck, man. Like, I have an extens- extensive collection of name tags and hairnets. Like, wow. And I just, it was so fucking funny to me. And then I asked, I asked Robin that same day. I was like, hey, what would you say if someone actually offered us a deal to do Scaryish as like a show, but they want us to travel around the country, maybe even internationally, and check out these scary places? And Robin just dead face looked me and she goes, Fuck that. Because she does not <laughs> want to go to scary places at all. And I'm like, well, I mean, that's kind of my dream. That's, it's not my bag, baby. I hate you so much. I think that would make for a really good fucking show or a Netflix series or a YouTube series where it's like one person that really wants to go and one person that wants nothing more than to not be where they're at. Go to fucking scary or spooky places or interview people that have been to those places. I, I, that's just the daydream that I was having when this all happened. And then she took it as like, so you want to travel the fucking country and go to all these fucking haunted places? And I'm like, well, I mean, yeah, like if someone pays us, like that'd be super fucking sweet. But yeah, that's where that all came from. So don't just toss me under the bus. Like okay. I decided to go Scooby doing. Anyway, Annabelle creation was definitely my favorite. Uh, considering like Conjuring 2 Blue hated it it wasn't great it wasn't the worst I didn't, I didn't like I, that you had you had to see the big nun demon at the end did it scare you is that why you didn't like it you no, thought it was cheesy it was fudge. too cheesy okay well yeah i didn't like the original okay i liked conjuring one i liked annabelle creation which is the fourth movie i didn't like two and i didn't like annabelle which is the third one right so those two kind of compete for worst of the series but i've heard the nun isn't good so who the fuck knows? Oh, no. I did really like Animal uh, Creation though. It Animal wasn't good. Creation scared the shit out of me to be honest with you. Yeah, I haven't seen oh, the yeah. nun, but our listeners have told us that they didn't like the nun. Oh no. Yeah. Okay, that sucks. Unfortunate. Uh, all right. So anyway, you can't really go wrong with a haunted doll, and uh, I guess it's a good precursor to the mov- new movie that's coming out. Annabelle three is fucking coming out. Annabelle three is coming out. Yeah. I did not know it's that. A, there's gonna be a sequel, and it's supposed Annabelle to- the nunning. Because it's all going to cross over wow. somehow. Uh, well, it's slated to come out July, so I think we're going to go see it. Hopefully, yeah, I'm I mean, sure we, we will. thought we were going to go see the nun, but you know. Uh, anyway, so I'm going to cover Annabelle this week, and because it has a lot to do with Ed and Lorraine Warren, I'm going to cover like a little bit of them and what they had to do with. And like I the said, doll. Lorraine Warren, if you're listening, hit us up. We'd love to talk to you. And Ed, if you're listening, you're fucking awesome. Thank you for doing everything you did. Wow. I'm just nice. saying, Ed was super cool, man. If you read the, the biography Are you of those doing, two people. Uh, you're pretty much doing like the pound your chest twice, look up at the sky. The two-tapper. Like... This is for Ed. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I'm sure most of you spooky friends have heard of Annabelle and its whole creepy factor, the fact that it's haunted, all that fun stuff. Isn't it? Okay. Um, I keep wanting to jump forward and ask you these questions about it. And I always do that. And then you're like, it's in my script. Like, <laughs> shut the fuck up. So for those of you that haven't heard of it, we'll just get right into it. Ed and Lorraine Warren were American paranormal investigators that are associated with some pretty prominent cases, uh, as seen in the Conjuring movies. And Ed... The first Conjuring movie was fucking creepy. It was good. I know I've mentioned it before Just on the, the podcast. Just the clapping, the clapping part. That, I forgot about that oh. part. The, I mentioned it before on the podcast. I remember being a kid and eavesdropping on my dad and his friend down in the basement playing pool one night. And I went down there and they were telling fucking ghost stories. And my dad's friend was telling him a ghost story. And it had all these weird details. And there was a fucking cop there. And he said that at some point they're in a basement and the windows broke out and birds flew around them. And I remember I remember that so vividly because I went back upstairs and I was scared. And in the fucking conjuring, that shit totally happens. And I was just like, when I saw the conjuring, I was like, I wonder if my dad's friend was talking about this shit or maybe he had heard about it from someone because that's such a weirdly specific detail that I've never seen in a movie besides like the birds to be randomly included during an exorcism. Like it was so fucking creepy. Birds flying into windows though is very, fairly common. That is very different in the conjuring though. They don't just like, it's a fucking, just a flock 
of seagulls. No, it's just a <laughs> flock of fucking birds uh, that just charge and they swirl around. It's just exactly how I pictured my friend's, my dad's friend's story. Okay. And when it happens in the conjuring, I was like, I really feel like this is the shit he was talking. Like he must know some of the people that were in this fucking family because that first conjuring when I saw it, I was like, holy it shit. It was scary. Yeah, it was. It was. I just the. It was just a very well done movie, and I think we watched that movie multiple times. Yeah, I kind of want to watch it again. I forgot yeah. about that clapping part. That shit's creepy. Yeah, I can't do, deal with the disembodied hands it freaks me out um anyway that's why she doesn't watch adam's family <laughs> oh no thing is cute though thing is cute uh what's the oh cousin it He's i always adorable. get i always get thing and cousin it confused uh cousin it is totes adorbs hit me up <laughs> did you just ask cousin it to hit you up <laughs> okay no uh anyway ed was a world war ii u.s navy veteran which I had no idea prior to looking all this stuff up. I did not know that either. And he was also a former police officer. That's awesome. So kind of freaking cool. Uh, and then he became a self-taught demonologist who unfortunately did pass away in 2006. Um, Lorraine is a self-proclaimed clairvoyant in medium. And for those of you guys that don't know, it just means psychic. Okay. Or psychic means medium. I, well, I was going to say, I think there are differences between, between a psychic and a medium. Uh, exactly. Yes. But in in simple terms that everyone can kind of understand. You were really trying not to say layman's terms, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Why? Well, what's layman's? Stupid purple, stupid person terms. Oh, no, no. For those of you stupid people listening, no. we're going to break this down, meow. For In simple terms that can just explain everything in a really quick and dirty way. I hate saying quick and dirty. I'm so happy you did it. You've been infected with it. Yeah. Is just, uh, she was a psychic. And Lorraine claimed that ever since she was seven or eight, she could see auras around people. And she didn't want to tell her parents because she didn't want them to think she was crazy. And I think we talked about it before, about whether or not we'd want to tell people those things if we could see that. Um, But let us know what you guys would do, because I think that'd be really cool. I'm curious. And that's the other thing, too, is that, like, I've read a story, and it was fiction, but I've read a story where someone sees auras around people. And they don't tell pretty much anyone because of two specific reasons. One, they're afraid someone will believe them and try and get them to, like, use their powers, essentially, to, like, manipulate them. Or two, and this is the other thing that I think would be, if if, if this is all real, that you say you can see auras around people is that they don't know what that means, you know? Yeah. Like, they see this thing around someone, or they see, like, whether you see colors, you see images of auras, or whatever the case may be, you don't know what that means. Like, say you see all the colors of the rainbow, and you see one person with a white aura, one person with an orange aura, and one person with a blue aura. You don't know if that means anything different. Maybe white means they're really good. Maybe it means they're really bad. Maybe it means something's about to happen, but you don't know. So, like, telling someone you see that brings these expectations that you understand what's happening to you. And unless someone else has had this happen or has the rule book, I don't think I would tell anyone. I'd be like, unless you can either help me through this or help me figure this shit out, I will keep this to myself. Because I don't want people to look at me like I'm crazy. And if I need to figure this out on my own, like, I don't need anyone else talking shit about me while I do it kind of thing. I know I've said it before, and I'll totally say it again, that I would totally Rachel Vice that shit. Like you would pretend it pull, didn't exist. Yeah, pull Rachel Vice and Constantine, and just be like, "Nope, I am going to ignore you. Pretend I don't see you until the gift just goes away." Because I don't think I could handle it. You know, I'd end up being like her sister. <laughs> wow, that's sad. Yeah, it's super sad. If you guys haven't watched Constantine and you love we Keanu reference Reeves, it fucking constantly. Yeah, yeah, get it. We reference it constantly. Constantine, ha. Uh, go see it. It's amazing. I love it. It's literally one of my favorite movies of all time. I could watch it on repeat. It's great. I could sit here and pick through it with some li- like critical analysis, but you oh, know yeah. what? It's a really fun movie. It's it really fun. is, and I enjoy watching it. And yeah. that's another thing I want to bring up, too. This podcast that we're about to do, we're not going to critically analyze all the fucking no, movies we go through. It's just what we... We're going to go through what happens in the movies yeah. and the parts that we liked and like the what best part... What makes us laugh or... The best part is I'm going to go over parts that I liked and I'm going to be like, what did you think about this part? And it's possible we'll shit all over the other person's thing and that'll make for some good podcasting yeah. fist um, fighting really translates well to an audio oh my medium, god i hate so. you so uh ed met her when she was 16 i think they met and she was sure or he was sure that there was absolutely something special about her like he just knew and he was like that's what makes you beautiful oh my gosh well they came together and they founded the new england society for psychic research uh which is apparently the oldest ghost hunting group in new england 
That's interesting. That is very interesting. I had no idea. And it's thought that they've been a part of thousands of investigations. Some uh, sites that I saw said like tens of thousands. Well, you got to understand, too, and especially with Ed and Lorraine Warren, and this is why I'm such a big fan of theirs, is that if they showed up at a place that had things happening, they were skeptics at first. They would treat everything as if there was a rational explanation. And, like, they even show you that. I think it's the first Conjuring movie where they're, like, they're in a house where they're investigating and they realize, like, the problem is the pipes. Like, it, there's actually not a ghost. There's not, like, something walking around their attic. Like, there's pipes. And, like, they, they've stated in multiple instances that most of the cases they went out to, like, the biggest problem was, like, the house was not level and that's why things would move. Or, or like, there was roll a problem across with, the floor yeah, and there or was a, Or there was a problem with the plumbing. So it's not like they went out to exploit people. They were literally just out there but to find the truth. there is a lot of controversy about all their investigations. And I can understand that some people were like, this is just a money grab. It's just a crash, cash grab to... Uh, fuck. <laughs> cash dab. <laughs> <laughs> this is just a money grab or a cash grab to make bestsellers, just to write books that you'll sell and make money off of. And um, cases like the Amityville Horror that they were a part of that became seriously famous cases, it just makes you wonder, you know, that... It's just like, if you want to be the authority on something paranormal, like, let's just say, out of the blue, someone called us and they're like, hey, something's creepy happening. I heard you guys had a podcast. You guys have done a lot of research. I was wondering if you could help us out. Immediately, Robin would say no. (laughs) <laughs> and then I'd probably be like, let me see what I can do. And if multiple people more, if more people started calling, like immediately people would be skeptical. Like you're attached to all these things. They clearly must all be bullshit. You know what I mean? Right. It's like just by being the authority on something or being someone that gets continuously included to, to a skeptic, immediately that becomes a sign that it's fake. And it's like, that would be like if you were in a bad neighborhood and the cops kept being called. And someone was like, mm, the cops are always there. That's clearly the problem. It's like, that's the most consistent feature of the story. It's like, no, that's who you call when something's wrong. It's the same shit. Who are you going to call? It's the same shit that happens to them in Ghostbusters. <laughs> the fucking EPA shows up and fucks everything up. And I like the EPA, but in that movie, they're fucking dicks. I'm just saying. And they think that because, hey, all these creepy things are happening. You guys are there. You clearly must be the cause. I think it's just a rational step that people take, but they do it in a skeptical manner. That just makes it sound more ignorant. I don't know. It just bothers me that people come up with these assumptions like, because I think the simplest explanation is always the correct one, I'm going to accuse many people of being frauds. Well, they have made a bunch of movies that have the tagline of being based on true events. And uh, there are investigations that show evidence of it being otherwise. So it's like... It, they say that it's true events, but it's like, let's take this tiny little bit of information that's true and then change a fuck ton of it. And so we can say, yes, it was based on true events. Well, I mean, but- that's just how movies are. Like, we've talked about that in the past. Like, movies based on true events are mostly complete bullshit. So that's why a lot of people are like, they're just doing it for money. But I mean, it's not like back in the 70s, they're like, so I'm thinking. In the late 2000s, we start a movie franchise. (laughs) Like, that's not how that happened. It's just like they're attached to some very famous cases that eventually got turned into horror movies because that's what everyone wanted to see. Yeah, I can I can see that. Um, But they're always described as nice and sincere people. So they're very kind people. It's just people are uh, some people are like, "Eh, they're like money grubbing assholes, but they're not, you know. At least I don't think they are. I like them. So, in the basement of their research center is where they created their occult museum. Uh, Because where else would you put creepy things but your basement? (laughs) So, in this museum, they surrounded objects like Annabelle with other satanic, demonic, possessed objects slash artifacts. So, it was like a whole just bunch of haunted things. (laughs) In one place. It just seems like a bad idea to keep all of it in but one place. You, you know how you look at uh, Zach Bagans' like, museum, how it's all spread out? Right. This is was not like that. It's this is like, like a storage room. Right. And it's all stacked on top of each other. Well, maybe not on top of each other, but you know what I mean. Annabelle is a supposedly haunted Raggedy Ann doll that is currently in their possession. That was my question. Because in the movie, it's like a porcelain doll or whatever. But No, it's a Raggedy Ann doll. Yeah. It's just a regular doll and i had a raggedy andy growing up or something very similar maybe and i fucking hated that thing the doll resides in a glass box at their occult museum in monroe connecticut labeled as 
to not be touched or opened for fear of what the doll could do. Um, and the Warren son-in-law, Tony Spera, stated that the doll is what I'd be most afraid of when speaking about the occult museum. And that's saying something considering the museum held things like a child's tombstone that was used as a satanic altar demon masks and other creepy trinkets. that's really fucking creepy and i really feel like talking to lorraine warren when they were making the conjuring movie that is why the annabelle doll got included in that story because like if you've seen the original conjuring it's not in any way shape or form directly connected to what happens to the family yeah but at some point the annabelle doll does become part of the story that uh lorraine ned warren go through yeah because i think they worked in like when they're walking around like this is the creepiest thing we own and i think that's why when they're making the movie for the conjuring they're like this has potential to be another franchise like this has brand potential legitimately yeah but you know it's a raggedy ann or a raggedy andy no, a raggedy, no it's ann. A raggedy ann so in order to not you know, like overlap with the copyright or whatever the hell it is they're yeah. just like let's just make it like it's a an, an original doll yeah in the movie and which they is made just, it they did a good job making creepy. it super creepy yeah it's absolutely so creepy Man, that movie's good. Uh, <laughs> anyway, according to the Warren's report of The Haunting, a 28-year-old student nurse received the doll as a gift in 1968, and it was purchased by a woman from a hobby store as a gift for said student named Donna. And Donna lived with her roommate Angie in a tiny apartment. And she was abs- Donna was absolutely smitten with the doll and placed it as a decoration on her bed. Then she realized she was in deep smit. <laughs> Sounds so weird. Worst pun. Uh, it's worst pun of 2019. You're welcome, people. <laughs> it's still early in the year. It's said that the doll began behaving strangely, and a psychic told this oh, psychic slash medium told the student Donna that the doll was possessed by a spirit of a dead girl named Annabelle Higgins, and the spirit was supposedly a young girl that resided on the property before the apartments existed, and. How that works is beyond me. Like how I don't know how they know that or anything. Um, But I just don't get that it wasn't haunted when they bought the doll, but then it became haunted afterwards. And um, anyway, the young girl was only seven years old when her body was found in the field that the apartment now stands on. So of all places, it was just that one apartment that decided like, let's haunt this thing. Um, (laughs) And (laughs) so at first... Donna and her roommate tried to accept and nurture the doll and the spirit. Oh, come on. If you find out that something is possessed, it is not your responsibility to like nurture that thing. It's just not going to go well. The spirit claimed that it wanted to stay with them and be loved. And that's of course, that's what it claimed. So Donna gave the spirit permission to stay with them. And then things got sour because no shit. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to, you don't say yes. You never say yes. Even in supernatural. You don't say yes. No means no. Yeah. The angels are like, let me in. You're no, no. I mean, that one chick did let Cass in. Just saying. But he's not an angel anymore. I just finally watched Cass have sex with someone. Oh, that's what you're saying. Okay. (laughs) Spoilers. Uh, Anyway. So Cass got ass is what I'm saying. (laughs) Uh, I love Cass so much. Okay. So they said that the doll started showing signs of malicious and violent behavior. And at first, the doll just changed positions on its own, and then it escalated to where Donna and Angie would find parchment with written messages on it, saying things like, help me, or help us, or help Lou. And Lou was their friend. I'll get there. I was going to say, who the hell is Lou? And the Like girls, Lucifer? The girls... Oh, no. That'd be fucking crazy. Just like in Constantine. That's what he calls them. It all comes back. The... <laughs> Oh, I love oh it's so many good things to watch man okay the girls didn't even have parchment in the house so they're like where the heck is this stuff <sighs> that's coming fucking from? creep it could have been some I mean this is just a skeptic in me but it could have been someone fucking with them that it they was told in about. Annabelle's prison wallet <laughs> wow no <laughs> that's fucking <laughs> weird and gross no if, like I was dating someone and they told me that they <laughs> that they had a doll that was possessed I would probably leave like little fucking post-its around that's there mean, saying some though. creepy shit it's funny though Uh, so then the doll started showing up in different rooms of the apartment with like blood or like a strange red liquid substance on its hands and chest. And there was a website that I came across that spoke of their friend Lou and his experiences. And they had this friend named Lou who was friends with both Donna and Angie. 
and he had never been fond of the doll since they got it. And he right away was like, you need to get rid of it. He warned them, like, get rid of it. It's evil. And Donna didn't believe it, so she kept it. And uh, Lou woke up one night in a panic, and he had recurring nightmares. But this time, it was different because he was having a bout of sleep paralysis. And he had no idea that it was sleep paralysis. He was just like, I can't. I'm awake, but I can't move. If you've never had sleep paralysis before, the first time you have it is probably the scariest time you'll ever have it. And I haven't had it in a long time. I've had it once since we started the show because we kept getting emails about it. And then all (laughs) of a sudden, I had it. And uh, I'm not looking forward to having it again. Uh, So nothing seemed out of the ordinary until he looked down towards the foot of his bed where he saw Annabelle slowly gliding up his leg and ending on top of his chest. And so when I read this, I was like, this is sleep paralysis. Like, uh, he said the doll began strangling him. And I immediately was like, this is old hag syndrome, except because he is so scared of the doll... That's what he's seeing. So he's having sleep paralysis where this old hag syndrome has manifested into the doll instead. And um, so Lou blacked out or went back to sleep and awoke the next morning determined to get rid of Annabelle. And the next day, as Lou and Angie were reading over maps preparing for a road trip, um, because it was the 1970s and Google Maps didn't exist yet. Yeah, you actually had to um, plot your own course. <laughs> yeah. The apartment was quiet when all of a sudden a rustling sound came from Donna's room. And it was just Lou and Angie. So they were like, what the fuck is going on? And so Lou crept his way to the room and waited for the noises to stop in the room before he entered the room and flipped the lights on. And when he went in there, he noticed that the room was absolutely empty, except for Annabelle, who was laying on the floor. So the room had all of its stuff removed from it? No, no, no. Like, there was no one in there. Oh, okay. So there was no there was, nothing else in there. There was no other person in there. There was no person in there because they thought maybe someone's breaking in. And so nothing was moved or were out of place except for Annabelle being tossed on the ground in the corner. And as he got closer to the doll, he felt someone was behind him and he spun around only to realize that no one was there. And then he grabbed his chest because he felt like absolute horrible pain. And then his shirt started getting stained in blood because he had seven scratches on his chest. Holy shit. Yeah. And I just got cold chills. Yeah, and so apparently the scratches healed in days, though. Like, they almost instantly started healing. And um, Ed and Lorraine took interest in the case and reached out to them. And they came to the conclusion that the doll wasn't only possessed, but actually being manipulated by a demonic presence. And so the entity took advantage of Donna and Angie and manipulated the doll to create an illusion of it being alive in order to receive recognition so it was like okay and permission to stay exactly so it was like i'm going to mess with this doll i'm gonna pretend i'm some girl named annabelle and they're gonna say yes you can stay and love me and i'm gonna fuck their day up so the worst thing that they could have done is bring in that psychic slash medium um because it gave that presence a voice and i have chills now too and it, it shouldn't have been speaking to them and getting permission to haunt the apartment was its end game, and so <laughs> end game. And uh, wow, so many references. The Warrens <laughs> claimed that the spirit was looking for a human to possess, and so they claimed that if it had been a couple more weeks, that it, someone either was going to have been possessed or extremely hurt. So it was just cray cray. And so they brought a priest in to cleanse the apartment. And then at Donna's request, they took the doll, simply sprinkled holy water on it and took it away. Uh, As the Warrens were driving back to their home with the doll in their car, it seemed like the doll was just not having it. And so the car kept swerving and stalling repeatedly on the verge of a collision. Wow. That's fucking crazy. And uh, so Ed doused the doll with holy water and made the sign of the cross over it and it stopped. Um, But when they got home, Ed sat the doll next to his desk where it levitated a few times before stopping. And it would appear in different rooms of the house when they weren't home. So this is why they locked the fucking thing up. Yes. And so they would head out uh, and come back to it sitting like on a chair right when they opened the door. Like, fuck that. And uh, (laughs) big ol' nope. So over the next few years... 
a few people who have who had res- disrespected Annabelle experienced really bad things. A priest was involved in a near fatal accident after leaving the Warren home um, because he had picked up the doll and was like, you're just a doll and like chucked it. And Ed was like, you shouldn't Bruh. do that. bro." Yeah. And uh, then a young man came in with his girlfriend to see the museum and he totally antagonized the doll saying that if it could stretch, if it could scratch people, do it. And so Ed was like, you got to go get out of here. And he told he made him leave. And so on the way home, the couple were laughing about the doll when they wrapped the motorcycle around a tree. They were driving a motorcycle. Yeah. And the man died instantly, but the girlfriend Whoa. survived and was hospitalized for over a year. And when asked about it, she explained that they lost control of the motorcycle at the exact same time that they were like making fun of the doll and laughing about it. Well, it's it. really hard to talk when you're on a motorcycle, so I can't imagine it's easy to try and turn your head and scream at the same time. But yeah, you shouldn't antagonize shit like that. And then like, it's just a way that you are tempting fate to do something bad to you. Yeah. And it's just stupid. It's like, <laughs> it's like people that are like, I'm going to live forever. I'm going to walk like, under all these ladders and break all these mirrors. I just imagine Shane and he's just like, hey, demons, it's me, your boy. I don't know who that is. You God! know this. Uh, anyway, so Lorraine Warren has since retired from the paranormal research game. At shortly after her husband died. Right. And the museum has been closed, unfortunately. So you can't really go check it out. Honestly, when it comes to that museum, it's so... it's not, I just... I don't know... If if I had that museum, there's no way in hell I would sell tickets for people to come see it. That would just be shit that I would lock up in hopes that it would never, like, be seen or dealt with by another person. Yeah. I would literally have stuff in my will about how that shit would be disposed of. Because I wouldn't want any of it to be any of it to be taken. It's just a bunch of haunted artifacts, essentially, you know, yeah. and cursed items. So it's like, no, fuck that. Zach like, Bagans is gonna pick it all up. He's gonna try. You fucking know he's gonna try to just make it a huge cash grab. But that's really good. Thanks. It's funny because like we talk about the fact that we kind of missed the big ones. Like I, I thought we had done Bigfoot. I thought I did Bigfoot like thirty episodes I ago. I thought you already did. I didn't. I was going through the list of all the episodes today. And I was like, I totally haven't fucking covered Bigfoot. And I remember putting it on a list of potential topics and it barely got any votes. So I was like, oh, I won't do Bigfoot. And uh, it's just one that I eventually am going to have to cover. But I'm just going to do a lot of research because I want to like I want to give that one the credence it deserves because it is like one of the most famous cryptids I've ever heard of. Yeah. And I also happen to personally believe that it's total horse shit. Okay. But I want to do the research to, to try and prove myself wrong. But yeah, I think that's another one when it comes to Annabelle like. Like, and I don't think we've covered the haunting that the original Conjuring is about. I don't think we've ever done that one. No. I think we might have covered the one in the UK. That the, the second Enfield Conjuring. one? I think we've done the Enfield one, but I don't think we've done... I don't know, though. It's really hard to tell. We've done a lot of stuff, so we just got to look back yeah. to the list. Um, but well done. Very Thanks. impressed. Good work. So this week, um, like Robin had mentioned, we are recording two episodes, uh, so we can have the one for when we're out of town. And uh, we will be on the East Coast, which is going to be really fun. And I was originally like, I should look up something East Coast, like East Coast Cryptid, and uh, see what I can find. I was looking through some stuff, and I'm like, none of this is really floating my boat. You think there's boat. something out there that's just called East Coast Cryptid? Probably. <laughs> and then I asked Robin, like, hey, you're covering your thing. You're covering your disease, right? And she's like, no, I'm going to cover Annabelle. So I was like, cool, man, because I am switching to my disease because I am not having any luck finding an East Coast Cryptid. So if you folks would like to hear me talk about an East Coast Cryptid, I have not. Uh, message us on Discord or Facebook or tweet at us and let us know. And uh, I'd be more than happy to look into it and see if there's like enough there that I can actually do a topic on. Sweet. Um, so it's going to be really fun. And this week is weird because it's like I'm really – I love doing research and I love having a lot of stuff to find like facts on, which is why I like to pick – Things in particular that are like documented by police or authority figures because then it's something that's like tangible. Um, and this week, because I am covering the Spanish flu, there's just a ton of stuff about this. And I find like epidemics fascinating. I love the movie Outbreak. I love I the love movie. Outbreak. I love the movie Contagion with Matt Damon. Never and I, seen it. It's really good. I'm going to make you watch it. It's just, it's entertaining to watch this whole fictional thing play out. But the thought that this has not only happened before, but almost certainly will happen again is creepy. And like, when you think about that, watching those movies becomes a little creepy instead of being entertaining. And I don't want to say scary ish because it's just too on the nose, Yeah. Um, but it's, it does kind of fit. And like from the inspiration of watching those movies and talking about it, I will now tell you the tale, dear listener of the Spanish flu. And, uh, lots of people got sick. The end. 
Oh, that was fast. Yeah, it's pretty good, right? Wasn't that's that cool. Fun? We're at an hour, so it's perfect. I haven't done that joke in a while, so I decided I was going to put it back in there. And what's sad is that like the it's kind of the extraordinarily short version of the story, but it would be more accurate if I said lots of people got sick and died. And what's scary is I could also say it's the story of how everyone almost died, uh, because that is also accurate. Uh, and the Spanish flu is literally a saga that took place on a scale hitherto undreamt of. And side wow, note, fancy ass words. Side note, yes, I did just quote Doctor Strange from Infinity War when he's telling Tony Stark about the scale of destruction that Thanos can wreak if he gets all six Infinity Stones. Jeez. If you notice that, then uh, ten cool points to you. So, <laughs> the first thing I should clarify is earlier I said epidemic, and I find epidemics fascinating. And some of you may not know what that means. So to put it simply, it's a widespread occurrence of an infectious disease in a community at a particular time. So you could literally, with this definition, classify like an illness that spreads through an office as an epidemic. So like if you hear Susan from accounting coughing one day and then a week later, half of the office is calling out sick. I just imagine like, man, Susan got syphilis. Oh, man. Now everyone else has now syphilis. Now everyone has syphilis. I, I worked in an office where they shut down one of the buildings. We had three buildings. Shut up. They shut down one. They told us like everyone here has scabies. Stop fucking each other. Oh, and scabies my are like scabies are crabs, basically. Oh, what? Yeah, totally true Phew. story. So it's like if you hear that, if you hear someone coughing in your office, then all of a sudden everyone's sick and you have a tickle in the back of your throat. You probably should have thought twice about eating those cookies that Susan brought for the potluck. <laughs> but it's like she just makes them so well because they're still soft with that crunch in the bottom. But fuck, you got sick. Oh and sometimes it's that it's that easy for an epidemic to spread. Or sometimes your dicks get you in trouble or your Shut vaginas up. and all of a sudden everyone has scabies. Um, but that's it's just it happens Did is what I'm saying. Did you write that in there? No. Oh. <laughs> but. That said, the Spanish flu was not an epidemic. It was a pandemic. And I'm sure right now you're like, but Adam, what's a what's, pandemic? What's the dictionary.com definition for that it's word? It's a board game. Well, dear listeners, pandemic is a two to four player game yeah! for those ages I eight and up. It. I fucking hate you for stealing my joke. <laughs> it takes about 45 minutes to play and it will be releasing soon on the Nintendo Switch. They just announced Shit. that. Along with, uh, that's cool. Along with Catan, which I'm super excited about. I heard that Switch is the new board game console. It is. That's the article I read to you. That's fancy. Uh, this part of the show is brought to you by <laughs> Pandemic the Game. No, please. Oh. Not really, sponsor but they us. should sponsor us. And uh, the real Pandemic board game is Catan, I'll, because that shit is spreading like wildfire again, and everyone I know is playing it. Board games should sponsor the hell out of us. That'd be really nice, because be we amazing. play so many. But anyways, getting back to this horrific case of a disease that nearly extincted the human race. Extincted? That's not the right word. Nearly wiped out the human race. Um, so Critically endangered the human race. That's good. The pandemic I'm referring to is a disease prevalent throughout an entire country, continent, or the whole world. So in short, it's an epidemic over an extremely large area. It's not confined to a small area. So what the hell was Spanish flu in particular? Was it some super disease? Did it come on an asteroid and our immune systems weren't able to handle it? Was it a hybrid of diseases that all mutated together? No. What's so bizarre about Spanish flu is that it was quite literally what the name would insist. Is it, it the was, same as influenza? It was the, the flu. flu. This, well, this is the thing. <laughs> I'm calling this the Spanish flu because that's a colloquialism that we use, calling it the Spanish flu. It's globally known as the influenza pandemic of 1918. Okay. Because yeah, it, is, it is the flu. The flu almost wiped out the world and what's funny is the name wait so but it's a, its own strain right the, yeah okay. i'm gonna get to it so okay. the name was actually inaccurate because you hear spanish flu and you think spain and if you didn't think spain and you thought of another country that speaks spanish you are so dumb what because the fuck? it's just not that's just not how it works and i mean you're not that dumb because spain the country isn't thought to be the origin of where this strain of flu originated so if you didn't think spain you were you were kind of right so, like all good stories that involve massive amounts of death, there's no 100% sure answer as to where it started. But there are some really good theories. So, since 1999, the general consensus has leaned toward a town uh, called, and I'm going to say this horribly wrong, uh, e Taples, which is how it's spelled, not how it's pronounced. And that's in France, and that is considered to be ground zero for the outbreak. And... Uh, the spreading of the Spanish flu and subsequent story you're about to hear takes place in the year 1918, which, as some of you may actually remember, uh, means this hit during the final year of World War Run, World War One, and France being the epicenter did not do anyone any favors. And the battles were still raging in France at this time. And uh, as a side note, I would just like to say something, and I thought about this when I was writing this script out, 
because I was reading about World War One and I've read about World War Two, and like I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in Boone Grove, Indiana. That's where I went to school. And like, where you basically, when you're there, you know next to nothing about other cultures except for your own and just assume every stereotype you hear is true because it's just repeated to you constantly. Okay. And the older you get, you get to middle school and high school, you start to form your own opinions from your own experiences. And the only three things I'd ever heard about the French is that they were rude, that they hated Americans, wow. and that they were cowards. That was literally I hear they don't shave either. That was literally all I had ever heard. And now I'm an adult and I have different opinions. Like it's so funny cuz like as a 33-year-old adult, I would like to personally tell everyone that ever told me that or repeated it after after hearing it to just shut the fuck up. Yeah, seriously. And I feel that way very strongly now because the amount of history I've learned about World War 1 and World War 2 is just absolutely baffling. The amount of horrific and unimaginable horrors that France withstood at the onslaught of warring nations. And they were almost always the fucking front line or the line behind the front line that would get fucking overrun. I've honestly never met a French person that was not absolutely nice to me. It's just, it's weird because, yeah, they might be rude to you. Maybe they just don't put up with your bullshit. And that's why you think that. But I've never been to France. But their country was literally ripped apart from full global scale warfare world war one and two multiple times and i'm not talking about like ancient history my grandfather fought in world war ii your grandfather might have fought in world war ii it's just it's crazy to me that this was so recent that this country was ripped to shreds and so many people died there and it's been rebuilt and it's still like when you think of like do you want to go to france now you think of paris you think of like pastry shops you think of like beauty you don't think of like oh it's a war-torn country because of like all the things that it's had to endure yeah it's so like absolutely incredible to say that they as a people are cowards when they face like these horrible gruesome and horrific fighting on their home soil and then had to happen again and had to deal with a full occupation by the fucking nazi forces and then they retook their home like that's why I'm like, fuck off. Like, you don't get to say that if you know these things, because then you're just ignoring the fact that all these things happen just so you can be like, yeah, the French are cowards. I feel like there's someone very particular in your life that has told you mean things. No, it's just I've heard this so much. Like, this is a 100% true story. Like, there was a time when everyone was going to get in the Iraq war, right? And France didn't want to go. And people started calling French fries freedom fries because they didn't oh, want to associate totally French with that. the fries because French people were cowards for not wanting to go. And people were making everything yellow and calling them French, whatever they were. And it's so fucking funny to me because it's like, have you ever had a, a fucking war fought on your home soil? Then maybe you wouldn't have such a boner to get like, get involved yeah, with one. Right. And it's just like, maybe they just don't want to do that to people. Maybe they've thought about it. And that's why they don't want to get into, involved with that. And, of course, that wound up becoming just a huge topic of controversy for the American people. Because it's like, how do we get out now? And it's just one of those things where it's like, you have got to understand that a country that has had war fought on its soil on the scale of France is different than a a country that hasn't. So that's all I'm saying about the French. We're always fighting in other people's countries. (laughs) We are. And, (laughs) I mean, we're lucky because we don't have to have this happen on our soil. I can't imagine having, like looking out front and having trenches dug everywhere yeah. and people dying all around. And then all of a sudden it's like everyone that has any sort of medical training, like you're fixing up people who are dying. Yeah. And this is what's happening while this shit's about to pop off. So there's this town, this place about to blow. It's probably oh, a shithole oh, 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 called oh, oh, E-Taples. Oh, oh. I'm just kidding. Um, I believe the correct, correct pronunciation is okay. I'm going to try and do this. A tapla. I think that's right. Sur la table. <laughs> Similar. Uh, and I know that sounded horrible and feel free to hate me for it, but I'm trying. So uh, this town had reports coming out of it during 1917 of a new disease that was killing off people at a shocking rate, but it wasn't spreading that much. And the disease was what later was like discovered. The, a span of time. Before three you... days. Holy shit. It was called the three day flu. What? That's how quickly people were dying oh, from this man. thing. And when something has a mortality rate that high, that quick, typically it won't spread because it's killing the host before it can spread. It's like that. That what's that game uh, that you play where you take play gink? Yeah, where you... I'll get to that. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the disease was later discovered because they had no idea what it was. They thought it was a bunch of different things, but they did eventually figure out this was just the flu. And you have this field hospital and camp in this city that was treating literally thousands of people for a variety of war-related injuries, and this version of the flu starts to spring up. It's a mutated version of the flu. They don't know where the fuck it came from. It just showed up. And now, 
I don't know how many of you out there are virologists or however you say that word, but there's one thing I think we all know about the flu, and that's that it spreads. And it's my personal belief, and this is just me, and please don't do this, but my personal belief is... Cover your mouth. You will not get better from the flu until you've given it to someone. And when I get really sick with the flu, I lick all the silverware and the glassware until someone else gets sick. And I always literally get better as soon as someone else gets sick. Side note, Scarish does not endorse spreading infectious diseases, so don't yeah. do that. I just watched, uh, I've been watching Dead Like Me today, and there's a character that licks everyone's shit and sneezes all over everyone's shit when she doesn't like them. That's really fucking and gross, because like, mine was a joke, Ooh. so that's really fucking gross. Yeah. Um, but seriously, though, every time I'm sick and I see someone else get sick, it means I'm about to get better, because that's about how long the flu lasts, this is about how long it takes for someone else to catch it. All right. So there's this heavy population of people all together, and they're all hurt or sick or mal- malnourished, and this would just be the perfect popping off point for a disease, like if you're playing Plague Inc., and this is the perfect place to start your disease, which I always name my disease as D's Nuts, because when it starts killing people, it's like, D's Nuts have infected the oh world. Oh my god. Like, D's Nuts have killed off more than the Spanish flu. So, it's just how I play the game. If you never played it, it's super addicting. It's on, like, every mobile device ever and Xbox. Probably PlayStation also, but I don't play on that. So. I mean, we play some games on it. I'm going to get back to Spanish flu. All right. The origin of Spanish flu is debated. Like I mentioned, some so historians... why is it called the Spanish flu? I'm going to get to it. Okay. <laughs> some historians don't think it actually started in this French town. Uh, some dude from Memorial University of Newfoundland, which is in Canada, uh, proposed the theory that the disease existed in northern China in November of 1917 and that the 95,000 uh, Chinese laborers that were in Europe for the war effort brought it with them. That's rude. Yeah, but here's the thing. As a side note, and I heard like 95,000 Chinese laborers. I'm like, I didn't know this about World War One. What the, what were they doing there? These were laborers who would follow behind the fighting, and they were on the Allies' side, and they would do all the manual labor and the support work to make sure that the troops didn't have to do it so they could focus on fighting and holding wow. the line. And like, as a side note, thank you, Chinese World War One veterans, because that's super fucking cool. They were yeah. literally rebuilding the country behind the people as they retook it. That's really cool. And so some guy said, like, well, it's we think there were cases in November of 1917 in northern China. And when they came over, they must have brought it with them. And they're, they're trying to figure out where this came from. And it's sort of like a fuck you, buddy, because this person was Canadian. Um, the Chinese Medical Association showed evidence that the disease had been on a lower scale circulating in the European armies for months, possibly even years before the outbreak. Wow. So if something like this happened today, there would be, of course, lots of finger pointing. And not to be outdone, an American professor oh, of course. claimed that the flu actually originated in Kansas. What? Which it's like America jumps into the conversation like, hey, we want to blame someone too, and it's us ourselves. Yeah. And, like, so if you're listening from Kansas and you've heard of Haskell County, you can go ahead and blame them for almost killing off the human race. Oh, my God. And who knows? You could be right. But no one's really 100% sure. And what is known about this disease is that it came on in the months of 1918 as the war was ending and maybe years leading up to it. Um, it was getting ready to, to break out and it was already there. Like there's people that have done studies in 2018 who have found samples from 1916 from people in France that apparently actually had this disease. What? They haven't published their findings yet because they haven't been able to take what is essentially they're going to take this virus again, put it into an animal and see no. if it actually happens again. You? There was some studies I read where I'm like, that's really fucked up, but they're all trying to figure out the epidemiology of this so they can figure out where it or- originated from. Is it that where they're taking like the ice cores and in the ice cores? That's what they do the at the CDC or the WHO, the Center for Disease Control or the World Health Organization. They preserve the diseases so in the future, if they return, they can take a, an original sample of when the disease was first there. So they can use that sample to see how much it has changed and based off that, figure out what they need to do okay. to prevent the disease from spreading. Neat. Um, so there's there's still research trying to figure out basically whose fucking fault it was, which is just funny to me. But the point is, is that by 1918, we know that it's already in three continents. It's in North America, Holy shit. it's in Europe, and it's in Asia. And the curtain comes up and the disease is like showtime and it puts on some fucking shades and it goes to work. And some pandemics are transmitted through fluid transfer. The most so recent banging. pandemic you can think of that is global, that has been prevalent in everyone's mind since I was born, is HIV. HIV is a pandemic. And it's the pandemic that we've all heard of, at least I assume you have, and I really hope you have. And 
now at this point, for the most part, we know how to protect ourselves from it. You wear condoms. You don't share needles when you shoot heroin. Jeez, we screen, don't do heroin. We screen blood for traces of the disease when donating and multiple times before it's like transferred into someone. Shit like that. Shit that we really didn't do for the 80s. You know, or I think it was maybe the 80s. I'm not 100 percent clear on like when we started realizing like, oh, shit, people are really dying from this AIDS thing. It's starting to happen. But Spanish flu wasn't limited to shit like fluid transfers. It wouldn't be held back by only jumping to a new person if they swap fluids or because they went on the pound town. <laughs> Fuck, I ruined it. Going to pound town Stop on it. the fuck truck. Stop it. <laughs> or because they went to pound town on the fuck truck. Like it wasn't going to be held back just by that. And the funny thing is with how it spread, like, have you ever seen Outbreak with Dustin Hoffman? I'm pretty sure you just said that you love that movie. I love that movie. That scene where the guy coughs and it follows the germs up into the air. Like, yeah. picture that scene when you think Spanish And then flu. you wear a glove and then the needle punctures your glove. Spoilers. And boom, wow. Dead. So what does that mean? What am I actually saying if you've never seen Outbreak? <laughs> uh, if this were to happen again today... How could you catch Spanish flu? Let's think about it this way. Oh, yeah. This was 1918 when it happened. We're talking about 2019. I was about to say 2018, but it's 2019. How could you contract Spanish flu if this came back? Uh, if someone coughed, if someone sneezed, if you kissed someone, phone zone, fuck truck, pound town, all those things would get you this disease. Sharing needles, obviously. The bodily fluid contact still. So, like, being in the same room as an infected person, you're pretty much fucked. Touching something that they have touched. A doorknob, a countertop, a chair. Think right now How of literally... Mu- it's like crazy because everything's ventilated now. Everything has like connected well, you, air passages. You're supposed to have filters that prevent diseases from passing through it. That's no where you're supposed to change that. them out. They all have that. That's what they're for. The, they say think... they're supposed to be 99.9% effective. They're still 0.1. Exactly. And it's like, just like fucking condoms and birth control, guys, it's not 100%. There is a failure rate. Ask your parents. So, oh, shit. <laughs> debating if I want to say that. I don't oh want to shatter God. anyone's world from realizing you were an accident. Um, oh. I was an accident. My brother was. I was the love child. Uh, I was kind of an accident. <laughs> that's interesting to know. Uh, but I'm going to keep going with <laughs> ways that you can contract this. So, think of literally anything that you have touched today that may have been touched by literally anyone else, whether it's a family member, a friend, a stranger, it doesn't matter. If you've touched it today, have they touched it? Because if they had the disease, they could have passed it to you. All I'm thinking of now is the cat and the fact that the cat's asshole has probably been on every single surface. It's a really weird thing to compare it to. But sure, if you're a cat owner and you think about like, has my cat's asshole been on this stuff? Think about probably it. In, has. Think about it in the terms of Spanish flu. So <laughs> that scene, like at the end of the reboot of It, you remember that? Where they have defeated this killer clown, but they're all like, it's like if this was Spanish flu world, they're all going to be dead soon because they cut their hands. Then they all yeah. hold hands. Yeah. So, and I'd also like to point out, they all cut the same hand on the same side and then held hands, which means that they're putting their non-cut hand on the other person's cut hand, right. which means they're not making like an actual like blood, blood brother pack. or sister oath. It's well, like, they, and then what's his name or what's her name puts their bloody hands all over the other person. Yeah. She puts it on Bill's face. <laughs> yeah. I was like, Ooh. like, yeah, Spanish flu. That's fucking gross. And probably AIDS. But like, I mean, it's, it's set in the eighties. I'm just saying, but like they all, they did was really make a pact where it's like we all have the same scar on our hands because we're all morons but anyways they'd all die but so you may be thinking okay if this were happening today i'm probably infected that's basically what i've just told you is that you're probably infected with spanish flu if this is happening today what are the chances i'll die well that depends how old are you because the first wave that hit from 1918 to 1919 had 99 percent of its deaths affecting people under 65 what so if you're over 65 if you're older you're pretty much good to go that's stupid and over half of the deaths that occurred I... happened to individuals between 20 and 40 oh we're fucked so and that, my next sentence is so we're fucked and the disease surged again in 1920 like they thought they was like gone and then it fucking came back it's the roaring 20 and it was just like it's the sequel what's up and that time 92 percent of the deaths occurred to people under 65. So even though the disease changed a little bit, it still wasn't getting people over 65. So if you're older and we don't have a lot of older listeners, you're like, fuck, I'm good. But if you're younger, especially if you're between 20 and 40, you are pretty fucked. And well, that's if you have this strain of the Spanish flu, there is no other strain of the Spanish flu. That's what the Spanish flu is. If you have another strain of flu, it's not going to be as dangerous as the Spanish flu was. Okay. So you may be saying that's pretty fucking weird. The flu is usually dangerous for people that are younger And people that are older and the people in the middle are pretty much safe. And you would be absolutely correct in that because it was bizarre. 
the people that were dying were individuals who were relatively young and had previously been healthy adults. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't. And it baffled people. And it still baffles them because we haven't seen a behavior like this in the disease pretty much ever before or since. And that's not to say that they weren't finding the disease in the young and the elderly. They were catching it, too. It's it just like, wasn't killing them. It's like the greater being was like, there's all these diseases that will kill everyone else. But you guys are kind of safe. So let me make something that will murder you. Well, all. imagine if you're really religious and you really do think that the world's going to end in your lifetime. And like all I could think of is the meek shall inherit the earth. It's like a disease shows up to target strong people. Like the meek, the young and the old are the only people not being targeted by this disease that is spreading like fucking wildfire and killing people rapidly. That's insane. So let's say you were like Robin and I and fall into that sweet spot for dying. Like what could you expect? Well, I think it's safe to say that all of us at some point have had the flu. And if you haven't, you're probably a liar. But oh, man. <laughs> you get an elevated body temperature because your body raises its temperature in an attempt to kill the germs or the disease inside of it. And so your temperature is really high. You're sweating a lot. The disease itself gives you vomiting, diarrhea, general nausea of the worst kind. So at this point, it just sounds like I'm just describing a really bad flu. And for those of you who have had the flu are thinking like, this is the worst time I've ever had the flu. Couldn't hold down water. Anytime I actually was able to hold down water, it just came right out of me in another, like another exit, whatever it could be. It's just, it's fucking horrible. This flu, the Spanish flu, also came with hemorrhages of all kinds. What? And you might ask, what's a hemorrhage? It's just a general term, really, for blood not, escaping from somewhere. Not to be confused with hemorrhoids. <laughs> exactly. But I mean, if you had hemorrhoids, it would escape there too. It just means that you were bleeding from places in your body. And in this case, your nose, your stomach, your intestines, your ears. And there were these, and I think I'm going to get this word wrong, but I'm still going to try it. Uh, petechial hemorrhages. Yeah. And it's when blood vessels burst under your skin and you get those little red spots. Sometimes you look at your skin and you're like, whatever red spot. Basically, yeah. a blood vessel burst and it caused a minor bleed. But it wasn't as minor if you had the Spanish flu. You get really big red spots and they'd be fucking all over. So it's just like internal bleeding. It's internal bleeding. It's external bleeding. It's under your skin bleeding. And on top of that, it's the worst flu you've ever fucking had. And so maybe you're hearing this and you're like, I've never had the flu. And now like I said, I don't believe people when they say that. But maybe you're like, I've never had the flu because I have a super strong immune system. I'm basically Wolverine. I might get a little sick, but I'm going to get way better. Well, then you are especially fucked because this version of the flu, the Spanish flu, would trigger your body's immune system to go into what is essentially Super Saiyan mode. And for those of you who don't know what DBZ or Dragon Ball Z is, it basically triggers your immune system to go into super crazy overpowered mode. And your immune system would attack the flu itself so viciously it would essentially destroy your body in the process this makes me really appreciate those face masks that they use in asia like yeah a little bit right yeah what's also interesting is the mortality rate was incredibly low in japan oh, and the, the spread shit. rate was incredibly low in japan because they wow. were extraordinarily careful about it because they were so afraid that it would decimate the island and it's crazy because if you look at different places, like if you want to look at like the actual epidemiology of it, like certain places weren't affected by it because they had like higher standards of health and places that didn't were fucking decimated by wow. it. Some places literally never recovered. So what? if you have this immune system that you think has been protecting you, this is a disease that will turn it against you and it will destroy your body and it literally will kill you. Your own immune system will destroy your body while it's trying to fight the disease that it's not winning against, by the way. And then your disease will make it worse and worse and worse. So you're probably not so proud of your super immune system now anyways. But this is the reason the disease killed so many in the range it did. is because these were the healthy people and their, their immune systems were doing the disease's work for it. And it's also the reason it was able to spread. Because the malnutrition of the soldiers and the ragged conditions it was in during World War I, basically everyone was fucking sick. They already had weakened immune systems, which meant that their bodies were not doing this, this disease's work for it. And it meant that when the war ended in November of 1918, all these infected troops were super grateful to head home and they just took it home with them. Wow. Which is why it fucking exploded. And individuals with weakened or underdeveloped immune systems like the elderly or, or the kids. young yeah. were not as affected by the actual disease because their own immune systems weren't doing its work for That's it. That's crazy. And this gives the new meaning to slow and steady wins the race. Because the super hyper aggressive immune systems were the cause of so many deaths. So if you're in the range of 20 to 40, but you're one of those people that's very sickly, you might just make it out of this alive. <laughs> 
but not always. The immune systems weren't always the thing that was getting people killed. You would get sick and people were dying from bleeding to death. A lot of times internally, a lot of times in the lungs in particular. Wow. Anywhere where you have a mucous membrane, anywhere where basically your body is persistently wet, but not like, oh, I yeah. hate you so much, <laughs> you would bleed from it profusely until you died inside your body too. And there was just nothing they could do about the internal bleeding. It was just like, you're basically going to die. And if you're thinking at this moment, wow, this sounds horrific. I can't imagine this. You're right. Like, I can't imagine this either. And I think most people can't. And so at this point, we know where it may have started. We know how it spread. We know what it did and who it did it to. So now that you have all this information fresh in your mind and the image of what it was to have this disease and die from it, let's talk about scale. Because this is where it goes from, like, gross or intense to scary. And this is why I wanted to do this on Scaryish. And I think people have a lot, like a really hard time picturing actual numbers when they're on a large scale. Everyone knows like 20 and 100. Anyone who's ever held that amount of money in their hands understands that, especially in relation to other things. Like people don't realize the scale of really large numbers. When I say words like million and billion, they just sound similar because they're really high numbers. Right. And I've used this example before of sports stadiums or just large stadiums that you can enter. And let's look at a number like a million. Okay, we're going to start with a million. Any of you that have ever been to a concert or a sporting event or anything that took place inside of a stadium know what that looks like. You know, it's just a big Coliseum style building that can hold a lot of people. So let's say, let's say we're all in a stadium and it holds 50,000 people. Okay. 50,000 is a nice round number. It's is that also what most stadiums are. Most stadiums are right around there. Okay. They're between 50 and 75, maybe 100,000 if it's a huge stadium you can cram a lot of people in there. Comfortably 50,000 people in a stadium. Stadium's packed. Every person's in the seats. It's a giant sea of people. So, let's think about this number first. And imagine the scale of this giant stadium and imagine someone showing you a picture of a single person before you went in. And they give you that picture and you're supposed to take it with you. And it's maybe someone you've never seen before. And at this point, actually, imagine it's a picture of someone that you know. It's someone that you can picture without even looking at it. So it's a spouse or a parent or a child. Someone who you don't even need a picture to walk around with to see. And they say, go find this person. Go into that stadium of 50,000 people. No way. And find that person. Like, that fills me with anxiety. Because, like, it's literally looking for a needle in a haystack. And that is a huge, huge haystack. And you can't even start to fathom, like, do I walk up and down all the rows? What happens if people are walking around? How am I ever going to find this person? You're probably thinking in your head of solutions, like, well, I'll just go in the PA system, blah, 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 blah. Let's just say everyone's just in there. They're all just sitting there and you have to walk around. You'll probably still never fucking find that person. It'll take forever. And you don't even have to imagine conditions being placed on it. Like, you can just get anxiety, anxiety thing of, like, trying to find one person in a sea of 50,000 people. Yeah. It's a huge number. I mean, you're thinking of it because you know that stadium, you know that size, you know that's probably around what it holds, and you can't imagine searching that whole goddamn place. But shake that off. Don't worry about it. You don't have to find anyone. You're just listening to a podcast. You're safe. But imagine the scale of a single person compared to 50,000 people. I mean, that's, that's overwhelming. And now picture that stadium. And picture that that stadium is one of 20. And 20 stadiums are all filled to the brim all with 50,000 people in them. How long would it take, not just to search the entire, the all these stadiums for one person, but just to walk from like the door of one of them to the next one, then to the next one, then to the next one. Like walking through the parking lots, going through all these, these different like places you have to get to, yeah. just to walk to the door of 20 stadiums. Like I'm fucking out of breath just thinking about that. I'm out of breath walking up the stairs. So. Exactly. So... These 20 stadiums hold 1 million people. Because if you're in one stadium with 50,000, 20 of them, that's going to be 1 million people. So now we're going to get back to this. Now that you have this scale in your mind. In 1918, the world's population was estimated to be around 1.8 billion people. That's billion with a B. And how much more is a billion than a million? Because we talk about this a lot, especially lately. Well, you had those 20 stadiums holding a million people. And you remember the thought of walking between them and how long that would take you and how exhausted you would be or all the faces in those stadiums. Now picture that single stadium again. Only 50,000 people were scaling it back and you step outside and you realize that stadium is one of 36,000 stadiums all filled to the brim. That's how much more a billion is than a million. It's literally 1,000 times more. 
That's crazy. So if you have 36,000 stadiums in 1918, it's holding that 1.8 billion people population. And of those stadiums, it's like, why are they all there? I mean, it's just this picture that I'm imagining for you guys, but it's like, you could never get all those people in the stadiums at the same time unless you're like all going to see Avengers Endgame or some shit. So now that you can kind of see and feel that scale, we're going to hit you with some numbers. We have 1.8 billion people. It's estimated that 500 million people were infected by Spanish flu. So almost like half, sort of, kind of, sort of. Maybe. Well, imagine like someone comes on the Jumbotron and tells you that there's a flu and 500 million of you are infected. And let's say they got all of the infected people into stadiums without overlapping with healthy. So the 500 million are in their own stadiums. Okay. All the healthy people are in theirs. They're going to announce the numbers, say like, if you're in these stadiums, you're healthy, you can go home. So that means there are still 10,000 stadiums with sick people in them. 28% of the population of the world was infected. That's insane. And if you want another way to feel how many people this is, and this one is like, I thought of this one, and I was like, this really changes it up for me. Get a calculator out or just do it in your mind if you can and put in a number for how many people live with you in your home. I would imagine it's probably two to 10, depending on how many people, obviously. Then add in family members, any family members you can think of. Add in friends, add in literally anyone you can think of. And when you think of a person, it's a plus one. And if you think of a family, you know, maybe it's a plus four. Who knows? And who knows how high your number could get? But it's a fun little experiment. Imagine how high your number could go up, like how many people you've ever met, how many people you could hit plus one for, and then think of all those people, or just think of one of them, just one, and picture them being plopped down into one of those stadiums. Now hit clear on your calculator, and I want you to hit five, and then hit zero, and zero again, and again, 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 and again. That is how many people were infected with the Spanish flu. That's so crazy. It is literally impossible for me to fathom. Yeah, it. that's so many people. And this is 1918. And records were extremely difficult to keep, especially given the conditions, especially on a global scale. But it was estimated originally that 40 to 50 million people died from the Spanish flu. And since then, since it's been studied and been given a historical analysis, the estimate has changed. The range is now 50 to 100 million people died wow. from the Spanish flu. This means that the, mort the mortality rate of Spanish flu globally across all regions, races, ages, was possibly as high as 20%. What? If you caught this flu, you had a one in five chance of dying. What? 500 million people caught this flu. 20% of them died. That is staggering. Astronomical? You cannot yeah. fathom it. 1918 is now officially, because it's in January of or 2019, it's just over 100 years ago. This was a version of the flu, which still exists. The flu still exists. I'd also like to point out, Spanish flu is known as H1N1. And you've probably heard of that before, because Spanish flu still exists. And people still die from it. People still die from it. My mom captioned something today, because someone died from it. It's crazy because... It was the flu, and the 1916 range, it mutated, and by 1920, it had wiped out 5.5% of the world's population. It's not a joke when I say the world almost died. If they hadn't figured out it was happening, or if people had been more condensed, or maybe if the war had gone on longer and extended to different regions and more people were being transferred, that number could have gone up and up and up and up. And that is absolutely terrifying. It is. And as of January 2019, and this is extremely recent because it's January 7th or 8th when we record this, this was just updated by, I can't remember who, whoever does it, but it's estimated that there are 7.7 .7 billion people on this planet, what? which is fucking nuts because it's only been a hundred years and we've gone from 1.8 to 7.7 .7 because there's a lot of fucking going on out there. Like, let's be real. So if you can still picture a stadium of 50,000 people and you were to step outside that means that your stadium of 50,000 people is now one of 154,000 other stadiums. That's how many it would take to fit that many people into these giant stadiums we're talking about. So let's let's look at this before we before we wrap up. If this were to happen again, if the Spanish flu were to return on the same exact scale, 
That would mean that of those 7.7 billion with the B people that exist in the world today, 2.156 billion people would be infected with the Spanish flu. Holy shit. Over 2 billion people will be told, you have a 20% chance you're about to die. It's going to take three days and it's going to be the worst thing you've ever gone through. But you might not die at the end of it. If we were to use the same death rate from 100 years ago, that would mean that over the course of two and a half years, the world population would decrease specifically because of Spanish flu by 423,500,000 people. I mean, just put it into a calculator. Four, two, three, five, zero, 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 zero. The number is fucking unbelievable. It would, if it happened again, the amount of people that would die would be just under the amount of people that were infected a hundred years ago. And that is the Spanish flu. It was absolutely horrific. It is unimaginable. It was 100% real. And it only happened 100 years ago. I just can't even. Im- that's a lot of bodies. You cannot wrap your head no. around it. You can't. I didn't even dig into how they fucking disposed of the bodies. Because I truly deeply did not want to know. Because they're still there. It's not like they just evaporated. It's not like Thanos snapped and they all turned to fucking dust, which was the most convenient thing he did for the universe. Because if everyone just fell over and died, imagine having like half of the population that you had to bury or burn or just get rid of. Uh, if Bandersnatch taught me anything, you chop him up. Wow, that's fucked up. <laughs> but Bandersnatch is pretty fun. But it's just like, I know we do things on the show that are scary-ish, but as I was doing all this research, I'm like, this is straight up fucking scary. And that said, before you all freak out and become recluses and wear gloves and masks Just everywhere. Just wear the masks when you're sick, man. Yes. But think of the advancements in medicine, because I know a lot of people get triggered from some of our topics and they have anxiety because of it. Triggered. And this is for you specifically. Like, Think of the advancements in medicine and science over those last hundred years. Like, Our technology has grown exponentially. And our ability to see these things and be aware that they are happening has become very organized. Like I said, we have the World Health Organization. We have the Center for Disease Control. People out there can say stuff like, yo dog, don't eat that lettuce. It could fucking kill you. So instead of an epidemic or a pandemic happening because of lettuce, everyone just ate different types of salads for a while. Or pizza if you were at Costco looking to get a salad. And then you're like, oh, I guess you twisted my arm. So I can say that this could happen again and that it probably will. And well, it, isn't it now that the ice caps are melting and stuff like that? That disease there's, there's, is just... Well, that's the thing. Those ice caps contain just like hundreds, thousands of years of ancient history. Disease, ancient diseases yeah. that are just going to get put into the into the ocean. So no one really knows what they're going to fucking expect. And if you've seen the thing, you know that thing's going to get out sooner or later. So Fuck. I, like I was saying, I could say this, ha- this could happen again and that it probably will. But the most important thing to remember is that it almost did in 2015. In 2015, there was something called avian influenza. And if you know what those two words mean, bird flu. <laughs> so you hear that and you probably think, oh, Asia, God damn it. No, this bird flu originated in the good old Midwest of the United States of America. And it was called H5N2 because it was just a variation of influenza. It was a variation of the flu. And it happened in particular on chicken and turkey farms in the Midwest. But we recognized it. It was identified, it was contained, and it was made sure it did not spread to humans. Did anyone... Oh, so no one died. So I'm going to get to it. We stopped it from spreading to our human population, but had to terminate the population that had been infected, which was chickens and turkeys. And no joke, they, was found, there it a in 20, shortage? they found it in 2015. I don't remember one. But as of May 27th, 2015, which was the last time they updated this number, they had killed... 43 million birds no to stop this from spreading holy shit this was a pandemic a that just did not cross over they had to wipe out turkey and chicken farms all over the midwest of the united states Those of america poor people they dude. had to recall all the birds that have been that have been sent out and if this would have happened around thanksgiving you might have had a global pandemic at least it would have started in the united states oh, and man. then had the busiest travel day of the year directly fucking after that but they were able to understand what's happening and stop it before November because they stopped it. They at least had this number of 43 million dead birds by May 27, 2015. And I say so they were killed. They were either they either died from the disease or they were euthanized because they were infected and they would die from the disease. So doesn't that make you wonder how much we eat? That makes you wonder how many fucking chickens and turkeys are in those farms. Like that's, that's why when you see incredible. those videos where people are just like horrified and they're like, I only eat farm fresh. Like I can't eat like range or I only eat free range or whatever it is. Like yeah. that's why. Because they cram so many of those birds in there and they're just their egg factories. Or Ugh. they're eventually going to be turned into like chickens or not chickens, but like chicken dinners. Would you eat like chemically created meat? 
I don't know. Like chicken? Like I'll try it, sure. I probably have. You really? I mean, we probably all have, and we just don't know it. I'm just saying. Oh, shit. So, this is an incredible number. 43 million birds, but only 205 humans were affected by this outbreak. And that's how good we've become at keeping this stuff from happening. Because this could have been the next Spanish flu. It really could have been. And because it originated in the Midwest, we probably would have named it the Mexican flu because that's apparently how we fucking that's name fucked stuff. Up. I'm just saying, like, the Spanish, the fuck, like, I think there was a, a town called Spain in Kansas in America. Oh, my God. They literally said that they thought that's where it came from at one point, And I guess that's why they named it Spanish flu. But it's bizarre to try and think of this happening today. And if you think about the times that it's almost happened, then you can understand that maybe it won't. Because we're a species that's capable of recognizing that nature is trying to fucking kill us and defending ourselves like properly. So don't freak out too much because we've made it this far. And like when you look back and you look back on stuff like this, we should probably thank our lucky stars that we did make it this far. We're just the lemmings in the Plague Inc. game. We're just the lemmings in the Plague Inc. game. What lemmings? And and the people that are trying to make the cures. We're the people right now that are just the non-infected people that you're trying to infect when you play that game. Oh, man. But that, my spooky friends, is the story of the Spanish flu. And like, I hope dearly that although I may have triggered some emotions and maybe some anxiety in some of our listeners, that there's at least one person out there listening right now who thought to themselves while listening to how this shit spreads and how scary it is, you know what? I'm going to start washing my hands. Because you should. Because it's fucking Why gross you if you don't. look at my hands? I looked at you looking okay. at your hands. And like, no joke, like... If you're one of those people, this is how shit like this spreads. This is why people become germaphobes because they've seen someone do something gross and they think that more people are out there doing it. They just haven't seen it. This is a 100% true story. I started working at a place and I came in with a big group of people, right? And we were in the bathroom on a bathroom break and someone went pee and he walked out. He didn't wash his hands. And for the next three years, he was the dude who didn't wash his hands to everyone. They never called him that to his face. But we knew, like, don't shake his hand, don't touch anything on his desk, he's fucking dirty, and guess what? He was always fucking sick. And I wager that the other people got sick were the people that went places and touched things that he had touched or went places where he had gone because he would never wash his fucking hands, and that is so goddamn gross. And if this is the time of, like, Spanish flu, you're literally killing people by doing that. It's like that episode of uh, Grey's Anatomy where... His girlfriend walks into the bathroom and doesn't wash her hands. I thought of that too. Like (laughs) Callie when she doesn't wash her hands. It's just like, it's fucking crazy. And like epidemics and pandemics to me are fascinating. I used to play World of Warcraft. I remember when the Blood of Hakkar or whatever that fucking curse showed up because they just released that stupid thing in Stranglethorn Vale, that new raid. It was basically a debuff from the ultimate boss in that place. So many words. It was just, it was, what do you mean so many words? It's just like all these words I don't know. Oh, so many words you don't know. Okay. Um, But it was just a disease that would be on your character for five minutes and then you would die. And if anyone came what? into contact with you, they I mean, would die. They would get it too, and How? they would eventually okay. die. In contact, what do you mean? Like just bump into your character? <sighs> Correct. Holy shit! So that's the thing, though. It was it was supposed to be isolated to the boss fight. So while you're fighting the boss, as long as he was alive, you had to spread out because if you touched each other, you had a five minute counter, or you're gonna die. And the boss fight took longer than that. So it's this brilliant mechanic of like, let's make it a race if they're not organized. But when it first released, the guys who make World of Warcraft, Blizzard Entertainment, didn't turn the debuff off if you killed him. So people were beating the raid, leaving the raid, and going to the major cities. And this isn't a joke. It literally spread through the entire population except people that were nowhere near the major cities. And it wouldn't go away because people kept resurrecting their characters and other people still had it. And there were fucking skeletons everywhere. You can literally Google the fucking epidemic that spread through world of warcraft and you will see pictures of this and it was so closely a depiction of what would happen in real life with how things could spread with travel that's that the cdc studied it to study how it spread and how people reacted because people were freaking the fuck out because they kept dying and they didn't know what to do and it was just bizarre because it was just one little small mistake where it's like this thing didn't turn off and it's like, it was so fucking crazy to be part of something, even in a digital world, and see the panic it caused people. Like, we can't even play the fucking game now. Like, as soon as I resurrect, I'm going to die in five minutes. And, like, there were people all over the fucking world that could cure this curse. They were taking it off of people, and they were just standing in the towns trying to save everyone. And, like, that's as close as I hope to ever be involved with anything like the Spanish flu. 
<laughs> like that's that's just the basic point of that story is like if you ever want to google that or you're ever a participant during that time like that shit was fucking crazy i can't even imagine it on an increased scale happening in real life and that's what the spanish flu was and like i didn't say what you're going to cover next week i don't know if you want to like break that like no I'll, it'll be a but surprise. i will say that when i was doing my research it like the spanish flu is in the top five categories of like diseases or epidemics or pandemics that almost like wiped out humanity and the one that I saw continuously in front of it is the one that Robin will cover next week. Yeah. So I am excited to learn about yours. But that is everything I have. That is all the fucking side tangents that we have. So, uh, yeah, that is uh, the end of the Spanish flu. So we hope you guys enjoyed that. Yeah. It was really good. Thank you. It's a lot of it's a lot of numbers. But I wanted to put them into a scale of that stadium so you guys could at least, like, experience it. So hopefully that worked. But I think that's just about everything that we have for episode 57. So, Robin, if people want to contribute to us monetarily, how can they do that? So if you go to patreon.com slash scaryish podcast, we have a bunch of tiers that you can sign up for uh, and help support us. We have physical product tiers. And uh, what I think I'm going to start doing because so many people have sent us books or given us books is I am going to start reading some passages or articles out of these books. So I think for Patreon exclusive for Patreon content. Exclusive to content. So cool. I think I like I'm that. going to start doing that. And then if you want to do one time donations, if you go to ko fi.com slash scaryish podcast, those are one time donations that will help us upgrade our studio setup. I'm very, very happy because we got our new camera. It has been working very well. We finally got the mounting equipment. Oh. I no longer have to tape our camera to our tripod. It's set up like a professional setup. So we also did the box opening. What is it called? Unboxing. <laughs> An unboxing video of all the mail that you guys have sent us, which is great. I'm probably going to have to come up with a cute name for that. But um, we, we got so many amazing gifts and you guys are so great. I had one and that made me flip my lid. I was very, very happy. Yeah. With one of them. And so hopefully we'll have that up super soon. Should be up end of Tuesday, beginning of Wednesday, just depending on how long it takes. Because it's video footage, it's a little bit more difficult to edit. But uh, it was a very fun time. So uh, we'll have that up for you guys to watch. And you can see what was sent to us for the holiday season. Yeah. So um, aside from that, if you guys want to email your paranormal experiences to us or anything that you want to share with us, storytime at scarish.com is our email address. You can go to scarish.com, click contact us. That has our email address. That has our P.O. box. And that has a form that you can fill out if you would like to submit us a story right then and there. You can also go to facebook.com slash scarish podcast. Please click like. We need more likes on the Facebook page. We usually get a bunch of them. They've slowed down a little bit. Everyone's been busy because of the new year and the holiday season. Let's get those going again. You can message us directly there if you want to. You can join the Spooky Friends group if you want to and post your story there for some instant feedback. Our Discord server is available. Best place to get it, go to scarish.com, click on the Discord link. It'll take you into our Discord server. You can talk with us. It's a big chat room, basically, with a bunch of different channels. Super fun. Tweet at us at scarishpod or message us on Instagram at scarishpodcast. You can also join us on YouTube at youtube.com slash scaryish, which a lot of you folks have done. We've cleared 400 subscribers on Woo! YouTube. And uh, you guys just keep going there. And it has all the live shows still recorded. You can also listen to all the episodes there. It has the, the episodes that come out like this, the regular topic episodes. It has the edited story time episodes. And it has the live episodes if you want to see what those are like. Yeah. So head over there. And if you want to watch us uh, do it live, you can go there as well. This week, we're going to do it on Tuesday. We're doing it Tuesdays. The day so that this releases yeah. at 6.30 p.m., right? Pacific Standard Time, and then after that, we will eventually have an announcement on what day and time that the show will move to, because Robin has a new school uh, school schedule, uh, and we're going to work with it's that. It's a cool schedule. Let's hope so. Uh, and that's all the different ways that you guys can reach out to us and watch us, and we hope you do. You can also watch us twitch.tv slash scaryishpodcast. So... Uh, this has been really fun to do. It's been a really long episode, but there was a lot of information to get to. So I'm, I'm glad that we did this. I hope yeah. you guys enjoyed it because I don't usually veer off the track of the paranormal, but I was really interested in doing an epidemic or a pandemic. So. Well, it's like I do true crime sometimes too. So Yeah, this was really fun. So we hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, let us know on our social medias. And uh, otherwise, we will uh, talk to you later this week. So Robin, go ahead and do that sign out. Keep on creeping on and we'll talk to you guys next week. Bye.